Have you ever heard of John Taylor, the water poet? For more than 40 years, he wrote an impressive stream of satires. Verse essays, travel writing, religious reflections, jest books, journalism and others. In 1630, Taylor's entire literary work, until this time was printed and presented in a single volume. This video questions the authenticity and identity of John Taylor, the water poet, because a series of weighty arguments and inconsistencies seem not resolvable. As long as you do not recognize in him the true Shakespeare, that is, the yet living Marlowe. To reflect, and to try to explain, those inconsistencies and arguments. It would be rather tedious, and even not necessary but easy, to go through all contextual arguments of the entire volume. Let's focus. A. On Taylor's first opus, ever written, in 1612, The Sculler. Reissued two years later in 1614, under a new title, Taylor's Waterworks. And B. On a few others of Taylor's subsequent compositions. Consider, that in those years 1612-14, experts tell us, that Shakespeare from Stratford, in his late forties, had retired and nothing is any more written. Inconsistency 1. Is it conceivable, that a young unknown poet, who never had written a single line, prior to 1612, was capable to compose as his first dedication, such a high-level acrostic poem? Inconsistency 2. Is it conceivable that the author and poet outs himself autobiographically, hoping for his literary muse to shun his former storms and live despite his scandal's calumny? Neither storms nor calumnies have been documented or known before 1612 for a poet I.T. John Taylor but the more for the true shakespeare alias marlowe concealed and banished inconsistency three is it conceivable that the author reveals frankly that his dedicatee helped to raise him from oblivion's den and his muse from obscure sleep to start so that he could commit his this new firstborn issue of his wit Consider. He committed this. That is, his, firstborn issue, of his wit. Only. Under a new identity. Inconsistency 4. Is it conceivable? A. That a panegyrist Henry Taylor is not identified as a relative. But taken as a friend, for name's sake b. Suggesting an invented name. c. Invented, by the author himself, who d. Already is seated on the wings of fame, but e. Any recent work from him not yet seen, though f. A. Poet born. Inconsistency 5. Is it conceivable? that an unidentifiable, anonymous panegyrist I.P. 
recognizes in him, in his muses, the boundless ocean of a poet's wit. Isn't in 1612 solely the true or real Shakespeare imaginable? And, by no means an as yet fully unknown. John Taylor Inconsistency 6. Nicholas Breton, despite opposite encyclopedic entries, only existed as a fictional pseudonymous literary figure. The true Shakespeare alias Marlowe. For details, click the link above. He let us know what his wit truly has done. And that tailor never shaped so fit a coat unto the core of any earthly creature. Be fully aware. Nicholas Breton, without a shadow of a doubt, belongs to the multiplicity of pseudonyms of the true Shakespeare alias Marlowe. Inconsistency 7. Is it conceivable that the dedicatee M. Wad crowns the fame of John Taylor, who had not yet written a single work, already with a future crown of immortality? Consider, in truth, the author has created for himself another, a second, a new identity. Inconsistency 8. Is it conceivable that another pseudonym of the true Shakespeare, Samuel Rowlands? For details click the link with the argument above. Praises the scholar who has made all these, another, things. And, brought, to Helican, arriving at Parnassus Mount. The absolute poet wit. Also, Rowlands marks Taylor, in 1612, as the exceptional, outstanding contemporary poet. Not such another on the Thames does row. Inconsistency 9. Is it conceivable, that John Taylor, so prominently portrayed initially, confesses in the prologue of his first work, The Sculler, that he never professed until this time, in print to be a poet and now to exercise and show his wit? Isn't this a definite, allegorical farce of his newly invented identity, the water poet? Inconsistency 10. John Taylor in a sonnet, between, the prologue, and a poem, the author in his own defense, compares himself to Coriat, an alleged English travel writer, and proposes between both of them. A division of tasks. Coriat should fool his wit at the court. And he, Taylor in London, on the Thames. Bernard Cap, professor of history at Warwick University, described in his impressive book of The World of the Water Poet, John Taylor as an individual who was able to create a bizarre new identity for himself as the king's water poet. The success of this new identity, together with his published works, made Cap realize serious points of inconsistencies up to now not yet explained satisfactorily. For example, Inconsistency 11. Paradoxically, there exists not a single contemporary source showing that John Taylor, between 1611-1614 writing of, and dealing with, Tom Coriat, in an impressive complementary philosophical relationship, 
never, ever have met, in London. Inconsistency 12. Why John Taylor, dealt with Coriat and his name in several of his books, extensively. But Tom Coriat never ever mentioned the name Taylor? A possible and plausible explanation. They both were fictitious. Quite deliberately, invented, complementary, literary figures of a singular personality. The true Shakespeare. Alias Marlowe. November 6, 1612 was a day of national British tragedy. Henry Prince of Wales, the heir of the throne, died. The totally unknown poet John Taylor had a perfect elegy ready for the press and public within a day. Why, on earth, not Shakespeare? At the age of 48? In 1621, Taylor published an amazing autobiographical philosophical treatise, referring to his personal life, entitled Taylor's Motto, with a Latin subtitle, And I have, and I want, and I care. At the end, of Taylor's motto. When summarizing his serious personal cares, Taylor confesses that he gave no occasion of offense to any man in name to do him wrong, that he, the one, is the greatest murderer alive, that does a man of his good name deprive, and to blast a good man's name with scandal breath makes his dishonor long survive his death. These confessions, in 1621, make no sense at all to a water poet John Taylor, but enough sense to the true Shakespeare, alias Concealed Marlowe. In the third section of Taylor's motto, at Curo, I care, Taylor indirectly, but obviously discloses his true identity when he informs us about his former writings. some few lines, made in the behalf of me. Poems, or verses, I wrote long ago. Six to eight lines are old, of mine own, much varied. They by many never seen. Therefore fit, to publish them. How can it become conceivable? That the so-called water poet long ago already had written poesy, Taylor's lines of interest, read. Did live, and sweat, and row. Where, like the tide, my purse did ebb, and flow. He thus compares his financial situation with the tide. His purse did ebb and flow. In Shakespeare's play, Henry IV Part 1 Scene 2. We read. For the fortune of us. The moon's men doth ebb and flow, like the sea, a purse snatched on Monday, and most dissolutely, spent on Tuesday. Can it really be? That Taylor identifies himself as with the author, of the play Henry IV, Part 1, by the true Shakespeare, take into consideration, Shakespeare in 13 of his plays, and in Lucrece used the metaphor of ebb and flow. In the third section of Taylor's motto, at Curo, I care, Taylor in another stunning revelation discloses his real or true identity. When he talks about the triple three, in the context of Marlowe's large verse epos, Hero and Leander, there he let us know. A strange away, posseest my brain, 
the muses sat together in Aranka. Whilst in my boat I did by water wander, repeating lines of Hero and Leander. The triple three took great delight in that, caused me sit and chat. Why the working brain of the water poet John Taylor is possessed by a strange, far away. His muses are reflecting the content of Marlowe's Hero and Leander, particularly in connection with the triple three. What might the triple three be all about? Taylor's strange insights necessarily presupposes his knowledge of a complex history of Marlowe's original poem, Hero and Leander, at the time, as well as its deeper interpretation in terms of content and context. Marlowe's poem, Hero and Leander, was registered in 1593, within weeks after Marlowe's final disappearance, but not permitted to be printed. Only five years later in 1598, astonishingly in the same year, two additional editions of Hero and Leander appeared in print, a, a larger extension, by Chapman, and b, a continuation, by Petto. They together represent the triple three. Inconsistency 18. Marlowe's Hero and Leander, registered in 1593, represented the immediate poetical, autobiographical, simile, or treatment of his alleged drowning. The true Shakespeare in 1598, Marlowe alone, having abandoned his identity, can be the author of the Triple Three. Chapman and Petto pen names of himself, as well as the water poet John Taylor, telling us poetically in 1598 his further destiny. Click link above on Hero and Leander's Triple Three. Inconsistency 19. How can it become conceivable that in 1621, John Taylor composed an autobiographical poem, Taylor's Motto, with some 1,300 verses, divided into three sections at Habio, at Cario, at Curo, which, by some days, preceded by a complimentary, formally identical autobiographical poem, Wither's Motto, composed by George Wither, also with some 1300 verses, also divided into three, but, complementary sections, Nec Habio, Nec Cario, Nec Curo. Both compositions can only have emerged from the same brain, which, as of Marlowe, felt a constant need to describe an object in a complementary manner. The truth of a multiplicity of pen names is disclosed in Wither's motto. My name, whenever it shall be written, should be obscured with twenty after it. John Taylor belongs to these pen names.